everyone, and welcome back to Off the Record, where we aren't afraid to ask the dumb questions. This week on the show, the toxic effect of the Campbellfield fire. The first ever photo of a black hole. And we get our hands on the new exciting Battle Royale game. Follow us on our Twitter or Instagram at Off the Record LT. And if you miss out on the show, you can find us on our Facebook or YouTube channel, Upstart Magazine. I'm Sophie Evans. And I'm Ashley Dryhurst. So, what's happening with the news, Sophie? Well, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has announced the next federal election will be held on Saturday the 18th of May. Following the 2019 budget, both Labor and Liberal are hoping to win votes with their policies around tax and the environment. A recent poll shows that the Labor Party are currently in the lead with an expected 2.4% swing come election time. The spire and roof of the historic Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris has collapsed in a catastrophic fire which began on Monday evening. The 850-year-old building burned for several hours as shocked Parisians looked on in silence. 500 French firefighters have since extinguished the blaze, for which the cause is yet to be confirmed. A World Health Organization study has found that measles, case, measles cases have tripled in the first quarter of 2019. The start of this year has seen over 112,000 cases compared to the 28,000 reported this time last year. The World Health Organization have urged citizens to vaccinate to avoid the illness. The Australian rugby team have committed to dropping rugby union player is Israel Folau for breaching the code of conduct. The Wallabies rugby player faces termination of contract following a string of offensive Twitter posts targeting minority groups. Folau, a devout Christian, has not apologised for his comments. That's what making that's what what's making news this week. Yeah, uh, it's a real shame about the fire the cathedral, melted yeah. my heart. I did want to see, I did want to go see it at one point in my life, and hopefully, with the way that it's going that it can be reclaimed. And, and it's such a beautiful old building with so many people are sort of develop this like connection to it. So yeah, I can understand. I mean, it'd be, if it was really like as a French person, I'd be really upset. Yeah, and, it, and it's a shame about the Twitter posts. Uh, I was really, I don't know, I grew up thinking that we were gonna be like the first generation that's not prejudiced. Um, and unfortunately it feels like it's kind of flipping over with the way that the fears are kind of manipulated these days. I kind of feel like it's just becoming worse and worse. Mm, it's a absolutely. Shame. Now, I mustn't forget. Eh? Hey, I haven't said it yet, have I? Well, um, put a little, we'll just line it up there. For a little bit of explanation, I don't think I did it really well last episode, but um, Ashley has a tendency to say cool a lot and I wish we had a compilation to sort of you know to see how many times but I think we can organize something I yeah think we can organize something <laughs> maybe next maybe next time but every time he says cool he's got to put some money in the jar so let's see how many times we can catch him out shall we see if I can get away with none this week on to our first two weeks ago a chemical waste factory in Campbellfield experienced a fire with poisonous fumes this left the factories in the area closed down Bill Nicolau from business Amsec Australia discussed his feelings when he found out. Uh, shock, uh, fear that you know we could potentially lose everything because we're right next door. Just the unknowns of what could happen and uh, if anyone was hurt in there and if any of my staff were at the office. Yeah, at the beginning, the minute you know you, you hear there's a fire near your business, you know you you want to make sure everyone's all right. Luckily, the fire started uh, very early in the morning and no one was here, so. Once, once that was cleared, you know, the fear went to, okay, what damage are we going to get? And, you know, even if the fire doesn't get to our building, uh, what kind of smoke damage, uh, runoff from the water? There's just so many unknowns. When you just don't know, you, you don't know what to think either. But were the businesses aware of the dangers from the nearby factory? We were aware of what they did and that there was dangerous chemicals there, definitely, but never, never did we know that there was that much on site. And, what potentially could could have happened it was a shock because we thought it was obviously you know a business repeatable business and it was well contained but we were wrong we were a little fortunate because we're in a group of factories um, we happened to be on the furthest side of the fire but a lot of our friends that have factories on the other side they, they were a lot closer the fire was basically on their back wall whereas we had a driveway to get to ours so yeah definitely um there's also 
you know, friends of ours, bakery owners across the road who lost a lot of produce and a lot of stuff. Mine just goes to everyone and everyone's safety and everyone's livelihood. Off the record, asked Bill to take us through the day when he was allowed back into the factory. We came in, the uh, police and the fireys had the road blocked. Mm -hmm. um, so we, until I got to there, I still wasn't sure whether we could get in. So they, they still had the road closed off Monday morning. So, we, you know, I, I came in not knowing whether we could access the factory and not knowing what condition the factories were in. Um, as you can see, that's our neighbours just there, and then behind them is the uh, fire. So, you know, just this driveway. Um, so, yeah, I was worried for them because they copped the brunt of the heat. Um, you know, and there's a lot of damage heat can do. We were quite fortunate with the smell. Um, we did have a bit of damage with our um, electrical equipment because of the power shutdown. Again, we were fortunate that um, the smell had dissipated by Monday and we could work here because the fumes were pretty toxic on the Friday um, and everyone that rocked up in the area here were, were saying it smelled like poison. Um, I don't know what that would smell like, but it was pretty toxic, they, they reckon, um, and from all accounts what the police were saying, it was horrible. Eventually ended up in here, plugged everything in and got straight back to work. There's no time to waste. The chemical waste factory was unavailable for comment. Cody Mason Low for Off The Record. There you go, thank you for that. And I do apologise for exper experiencing uh, some technical difficulties this morning. But mm. anyway. Now over to, over to sport. This week, uh, it's been a bit strange. Many NBA coaches have been fired or have stepped down this week uh, during playoffs. Here to talk more. Oh. <laughs> Jack, Tom. Hey guys, how you doing? Yeah, yeah good, good. Now, what's going on? <laughs> Help us out here. Well, since the playoffs have begun, uh, there have been a slew of NBA coaching firings or changes, uh, which is pretty unprecedented in this time frame. So, just yeah. before we get into it, I'm just going to run down the list um, of coaches that have been fired. We've had Luke Walton fired by the Lakers. We've had JB Bickerstaff fired by the Grizzlies. We've had Larry Drew step down from the Cavs. And we've had Dave Yorger fired from the Kings, but additionally, the first coach I mentioned, Luke Walton, has been hired by the Kings. So that's four people who have changed their roles. And for those who aren't hugely familiar with um, the NBA, whereabouts are we in the season? Uh, we have just begun the first round of the NBA playoffs. And they're already people are already changing roles? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think some owners are just impatient and they just want to get things going as quickly as possible. They don't have time to wait for the true off-season when the finals are done and they're really resetting everything. So does, that, does that have effect on the players themselves? Uh, I think it can absolutely have an effect in the sense that there's sort of a culture that comes with a coach. Yeah. Um, coaches, and, coaches yeah. they tend to have a particular bond with their players and also players have been taught to play a certain way on their said coach. So when this coach gets fired, then it's like they've got to learn a whole new game plan and sometimes this game plan may not involve a, such a um, major role for one player whereas another player may be thrown into the deep end when he's not ready and it just ends up with more problems than before. But th This is a business so sort of thing. Owners are in the business of winning. Winning championships, winning games, making sure fan attendance stays high. Yeah. Can the relationship really because i feel like a relationship between a coach and a player could really affect the way that a player plays the game yeah absolutely there's certain there's a certain like personal bond that some players have with particular coaches and if that that has the potential to change just like that and then now the players have to adapt and they have to get their emotions in check and they really have to get over it quickly to be able to continue to play at a high level so and why would they sorry why would they risk something like this um, owners, a lot of NBA owners don't really care about that stuff. They're kind of all business. If they see a team that's not performing up to their standards, they're just going to make an instant change. And the reason coaches are really affected this drastically and this quickly is because they just they just get the blame because they are the sort of captains of the team and they control uh, how they play. 
So the second something's going wrong, they just go, no, you're out. And is this Quick. common in NBA? Uh, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, it's just they, they get no notice. Coaches, coaches, can yeah. be, coaches can be sacked within a year. What, just in and out? Five, we went, yeah. can be sacked in five years, in a year. They could be sacked in five games if they're not performing. Yeah, and the Lakers, quite a big team. Yeah. Had they, you'd think they'd have experience in this sort of stuff. How long was, was it Luke? Was it Luke that got fired uh, from Yeah, the Luke Walton got fired and from the Lakers. how long was he in the team? He was a part of the Lakers for, I think, three seasons. But this is the first season that they've had LeBron James on their team. So it is a quite puzzling to me that they've fired him so quickly, mm. considering the, the injuries they had, the misfortune they had during this season. It's weird to make such a change so drastically. Mm. Um, but only time will tell. Some owners are just impatient, and that's just a fact of the NBA. Do you think it'll have a positive effect in the end, or are you a bit worried about your own teams? Um, only you'll have to just watch next season because we'll only know if, like, once the new season starts. Can't oh. really tell now. Something to look forward to. Thank mm-hmm. you so much today. Thanks no worries, so guys. much, Thanks guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Well, for the first time, scientists have photographed a black hole, with Katie Bowman getting praise for the algorithm that made the project possible. Cody Matheson Low reports. Although we have some ideas to what a black hole might look like, we've never actually taken a picture of one before. However, you might be surprised to know that that it may soon change. We may be seeing our first picture of a black hole in the next couple years. That's Katie Bowman. You've probably heard about it, mainly because she was the lead researcher for the recently photographed black hole. This photo has had the internet ecstatic, and the internet being the internet has also memed it. A photo like this was seen as impossible, as Katie explains. Well, it turns out that by crunching the numbers, you can easily calculate that we would need a telescope the size of the entire Earth. And if we could build this Earth-sized telescope, we could just start to make out that distinctive ring of light indicative of the black hole's event horizon. Was that the end of it? Obviously not, because... Modern problems require modern solutions. Using multiple telescopes around the world, a Harvard research team was able to construct the photo that is 26,000 light years away. This has also excited the science community. We're pretty excited. It looks like the silhouette of a black hole, this thing that's been in science fiction since forever. Um, And it's an exquisitely tricky measurement to make. Things a long way away. It's very, very small. And it's very, very hard to get any sort of visualization of it all. We've theoretically predicted these things. So all of theoreticians ran around making detailed calculations of black holes. But they never actually knew a black hole existed. They didn't really think they were real things. They just used it as a, as a sort of a test case to do mathematical calculations. And this was in the 1920s. So it's really taken a hundred years for people to actually confirm that these objects are real. Theoretical physics hasn't really advanced since the 70s, to be honest. But instrumentation, so measuring the predictions of theoretical physics, has seen incredible advances. So that's why we're seeing all these amazing things. One of the main reasons Katie has become a celebrity is because she is a woman in a historically male-dominated field. So do you reckon this discovery will give more of an influence for girls to want to get into the science field? I hope so. Everybody I know in physics that I work with is very keen to address the gender imbalance. It's there, it's real. For them to think, okay, I I can do this. I don't have to be a middle-aged white European bloke in a suit. That is healthy for the science, it's healthy for the culture. Um, We would love to see more young women come into the field and stay in the field as well. That's another problem. We see quite a few women coming through PhD programs and so forth, but they don't always make it to be senior professors. Um, The reasons for that are complex and not always pretty. A complaint from the internet is that the image is too blurry, but the fact of the matter is if we could get it any clearer, it would be right in front of us. And if it was right in front of us, well, that would probably be the abyss for us, so let's just settle for the blurry image for now, So this is the best we're going to get. While we won't be seeing a black hole with our own eyes for a very, very long time, we can still try to explore the galaxy as best as we can. Cody Mepson Lowe for Off The Record. Thank you for that story, Cody. And now we're joined by Sky Lacey. Sky has been inducted into the Banyul 100 for helping make Viewbank College and their local community a safer space for LGBT plus people. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, may I ask your pronouns? Yes. Uh, the pronouns I use are they and them. Okay. Yes. Um, 
just to ask the question that makes it a lot easier for everyone, the pronouns, they're associated with your gender, asexual. Yes. Can you explain the difference or what the difference between asexual and non-binary? Are they all the same? Yeah, so it's actually agender. Sexuality is obviously sexuality, <laughs> yeah. Um, but non-binary is generally the header that we use. Um, so there's obviously gender and then there's transgender and then there's binary genders, which is male and female. And non-binary is just anything that falls underneath that and... Um, a gender is just generally the feeling of disconnect between any of the genders. Mm -hmm. I read the article on the 100 bail. Yeah. You described it as if there was a spectrum yes. as a line, <laughs> the line would be separate from that spectrum. Exactly. Yeah, it's a really interesting way of visualising it. Yeah. And I thought that was really good. I thought it was a simple way of understanding it. Yeah. So you've done a lot of work to sort of make a safe space for your local community. How is it, how important is it for LGBT young people to have a safe space? I would argue it's very important. Other people would argue differently, but um, to give children and youth a space to be themselves is important in any situation. And uh, for LGBT youth, it's about going into a space where people always use the right pronouns and always use the right name and always be there accepting of any changes that you might have in your coming out journey. Mm. You said that some people are against it. What's the negative argument to having, to having this safe space? Um, people think that having a safe space is grooming. It's like allowing people to change their children rather than allowing them to be themselves. Kind of like forcing them into exactly. this situation, this like algorithm that spits out what... Yeah. Yeah, no, I get that. Yeah. I get that. Um, and do you think Australia is doing enough to sort of recognise and support LGBT plus people? Um, I would say that we're getting better. Um but we're not there. Uh, the turn of the law with same-sex marriage was massive. I cried so much when it happened. Um, happy tears, of course. Mm. Um, but it has still, for education-wise, has to come a long way. Like, we still don't have sexual education for LGBT youth. Um, there's nothing about gender in our health system yet. And... Um, yeah, we really have a long way to come education-wise and also providing that safe space for children to grow up with places like minus 18 um, stepping forward. We are doing a little bit better. Could we <laughs> perhaps follow other countries maybe? Yes, um, definitely. There are countries that I would never want to follow, of course, but um, there are other countries that are putting the right m measures in for their systems, for sure. Now, with future aspirations, what are you going to be doing to try and take a step further? Because you've already done a lot of work. Do you have any projects that are coming up? Uh, at the moment, I don't. Um, I'm always looking to volunteer in the community in some way. Um, previously, I've done volunteering with... Um, smaller organisations and also, as you know, like organising the um, group at my school and I worked with, I work and continue to work with the Banyul Council. I was previously with the youth aspect of it and now I'm with the adult aspect of it, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I'm still in doing, so I'm in the LGBT advisory committee now for the um, Banyul Council which is very interesting. We get to implement bigger changes that actually affect people's, like, um, education-wise and day-to-day -day life rather than smaller projects that I used to organise. And, um, sorry, it's a sort of, like, different topic, but I was wondering, what is your opinion on the work that's been going on about um, making school uniforms a bit more gender-neutral? Because, like, my school's been through the change. Like, I've started letting us exchange uniforms. And yeah. What do you think? Is it, are we going good? Yes. Well, 
we could be doing better. Of course, we always could be. But the change that is happening is amazing. Um, I know that my previous high school has changed their uniform rules um, after a very strongly worded essay that I wrote. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but I know that there are still private schools out there that are very, very strict about their uniforms. Any um, gendered schools, like boys or girls schools, especially religion schools, are extremely strict about their uniform. So there's still a long way to go. Yeah. Is there any way you can point people to get more knowledge on this movement? Yes. Um, I would just say using the internet is, it's very easy. <laughs> um, I would say in terms of like understanding, it's really just about educating yourself. Don't look straight into the big issues. Look at smaller things, how people's coming out stories might reflect um, society and all of that kind of stuff and educate yourself. Um, just yourself to be more open and accepting of anyone who you might run into is just like the biggest step you could take. Um, and then having that background knowledge allows you to take part further in like acceptance. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank really you. Really appreciate it. Now, this week on the Culture Corner, we get a new exciting addition to the Battle Royale genre. Hey guys, welcome to the Culture Corner. I'm Matthias. I'm Dorita. Here on the show, we bring you pop culture news and game reviews. We were very lucky to get our hands on the closed alpha for Proliferate's new battle royale game, Spellbreak. The battle royale genre is fairly simple. It's a large group of people dropped into a danger zone who collect the loot in order to survive. The last to survive wins. It was created by gamers as mods for games that already existed. As the genre got bigger and got better, it can't, then went on to the Twitch streamers who created their own storyline with their viewers. But I know for a second you're like, Atheos, there's already so many at the moment. And I agree, there's a lot, but there is a lot that makes Spellbreak different. The first difference we noticed was the fact that there are no guns in the game. You play as a wizard or in Spellbreak's world, a breaker where it's your job to then exile all other opponent wizards. Another big difference in the game is the fact that all abilities are projectiles, not hit skin. This actually makes the combat way more strategic in how you actually go about fighting because you need to plan out your moves more thoroughly. The art style that Pro Laterate has chosen for the game is actually quite fun with all of its colours. It actually reminds me quite a bit of um, Breath of the Wild. The way that the cell shading works in this, in this game it's very similar to that with the vibrancy of colours, the way that your character's outlined. It's, it's quite beautiful and almost like a, a painting brought to life. Because all magic in Spellbreak is based on the elements, the elements have a way of interacting with each other. Just say Dorito and I were playing a game together on the same team and I had a wind gauntlet. And I have an electricity gauntlet. When we combine our powers together, it actually makes a thunderstorm. This opens up combat to a much larger scale, combining all the different elements to create new and fun ways of fighting. So I'm a huge fan of the Battle Royale genre. I've played all the games such as Fortnite, pa Player Unknown's Battleground, I played Apex Legends a lot. So I was really excited to hear about the new game Spellbreak. Yeah, uh, Battle Royale games for me, they're not quite my game type, but I played a little bit of Fortnite with a couple of friends and stuff like that. But Spellbreak actually really interests me. The, the graphical style is actually really captivating and its gameplay is really, really intricate. T to me, it actually almost felt as if I was playing an RPG at times. Yeah, uh, it definitely has elements of RPG, like the collecting of gauntlets, upgrading your items, uh, having different classes and abilities. It's quite refreshing when it's quite new to the genre. So considering that it is quite different from most Battle Royale games, to you, what makes Spellbreak unique in its style? Uh, I would probably say the movement. A lot of Battle Royale games are very military based, very ground based. You do have like your player unknown battlegrounds that has like the vehicles, but nothing is quite as vertical as Spellbreak. Uh, a, lot of a lot of jumping, there's a lot of abilities that get you into the air. And there's also, there's a huge advantage to being in the air, considering that a lot of the abilities, when they hit the ground, have sort of an area of effect. And if you have the upper ground during a fight, 
you definitely have the advantage. This game is just so great when it comes to finding new and inventive ways to go about combat. Yeah, with such a saturated genre at the moment, with all big companies trying to get their hand in the gold, it's really nice to have a game that really takes you away from what the normality is. It's almost like it's using the battle royale genre, but it's really pushing its own game. It's a whole new take on the battle royale. It almost ignores what it actually is. Though. Hey guys, thank you so very much for joining us on the Culture Corner. Hopefully Spellbreak comes out soon and you guys can get your hands on it because it is so much fun. If you have any questions or suggestions for next week's show, please follow us on our Twitter page down here. I've been Atheos. And I've been Dorito. And we want to thank you guys for watching. We will catch you next week. See ya. Bye. It's an incredible game. Really shouldn't be an alpha, but looking forward to coming out. Can't for wait. now, for now. Uh, what's happening in Melbourne? What? That was a lovely uh, little introduction. I like nice that. Action. I feel so official now. <laughs> um, so, as you might know, mid-semester break is finally here. Yes. yes. Thank yes, God. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so we've got heaps of events going on, so you have no excuse to be bored these holidays. Mm -hmm. First up, we have Neon Playground, which is happening at Melbourne Zoo, which is in Parkville. And that's um, beginning on the 12th, which was has begun actually and is on till Saturday the 27th of April which is on each night from sorry the event is on each night from 5 30 to 9 30 and all all you can sorry what you can do is see Melbourne Zoo after dark which is really exciting it's <laughs> filled with art exhibitions lights interactive performances all celebrating wildlife conservation Ooh, so exciting. the tickets are a little bit pricey they're around the $40 mark mm -hmm. but all proceeds will go towards conservation of the southern corroboree frog which is an endangered species so Save the frog. good cause to get behind cute animals, cute animals. a highlight of this event is a really really cool imagining of Graham Bass's waterhole I don't know if you read that book when you were younger it's I a haven't. really cool book really cool illustrations I mean, I think I probably need to put some coins into the culture. Hey, no. we got someone. Oh, wow. Not mine. Not mine. Wow. Um, so, and then there's also a 600 meter LED neon maze lit up in the colors of the Southern Corroboree Frog. Ooh. So check the website for more information and for tickets. And that's the Neon Playground. Looking forward to it. Yeah, awesome. And another event that's going on is at Melbourne Museum, which is an exhibition called Revolutions, Records and Rebels. Interesting. Uh, this is starting, sorry? Interesting. Y yeah, interesting title. And it's actually celebrating the huge cultural changes that occurred during the 1960s in terms of fashion and politics and music, especially. Uh, and it's developed in collaboration with the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, as well as Sennheiser, the audio brand. Uh, and this is such a cool exhibition because there's over 500 rare artifacts in this exhibition, including mini dresses worn by Twiggy, handwritten lyrics for Losing the Sky with Diamonds, uh, Mick Jagger's stage costume is in there as yes. well, and a real guitar smashed by Pete Townsend. So it's nice. really cool. <laughs> uh, and of course, Sennheiser will be providing an immersive sound experience by playing some of the 60s music through the um, Sennheiser headsets that they'll be providing. So it absolutely cannot be missed. Yeah, it's gonna be great. That sounds a awesome. Super packed week. Yeah, I'm gonna fangirl out there. I'm it's honestly gonna be so not cool. sure if I have any time during the study break. It's There's more always... of like a work break for me. Yeah. So I, mean... I think I've got maybe like 17 hours of filming planned for that week. Wow. So hopefully wow. I'll be able to see the neon. Unfortunately, yeah. it means that we won't have a show next week because oh. we are all on break, but hopefully everybody has a nice sort of chilled, laid back Easter. I've got a lot of chocolate in my plans. Oh, don't forget about assessments. Don't freak yourself out. It is, do keep on top of it. Yes, <laughs> I definitely should be told that. <laughs> Yeah, so just sort of chill, but not too chill. Mm, unfortunately, this is all we have time for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. If you want to follow us on Twitter or Instagram, at Off The Record LT, and catch up on YouTube and Facebook. I'm Sophie Evans. I'm Ashley Dryhurst. See you later. Bye.